Today we have a paper about modeling dynamic systems with some smart equivariants. If you want to join these reading group sessions yourself, all the information is down in the description. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for Hannes for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So my name is uh, Miltos, Miltos Kofinas. Michael is my uh, official name. Um, and uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam, uh, supervised by Australia Gavez. Uh, yeah, I'm almost uh, done with my second year of PhD. Uh, and uh, the topic of my PhD is um, future forecasting, future spatial temporal forecasting um, with applications in autonomous driving. This is one of the main applications. Um, so trying to predict uh, what will happen uh, or which action in the more general sense. Uh, but for now, we have been uh, focusing on trajectories. Uh, and yes, today I will um, present to you or we'll have a discussion uh, on our uh, recent work presented on NeurIPS um, on rotor translated local coordinate frames for interactive dynamical systems. This work was uh, done in collaboration uh, with Navin Shankar Nagaraja. Uh, who works at uh, the Department of Autonomous Driving for the BMW Group, and my supervisor, uh, Stratius Gavez. So in this work, uh, we're interested, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, modeling interacting systems of objects. These systems are omnipresent in nature. Um, some examples include systems of uh, subatomic particles, um, or all the way to uh, end body systems of celestial objects. Uh, they can also uh, include molecules, molecular systems, um, as well as systems that are more human centric, uh, like motion capture or uh, traffic scenes with pedestrians, cars, bicycles, and so on. Uh, in, the, in this work, um, there are a lot of um, interacting systems in nature. But uh, more specifically, we're interested uh, in systems that, uh, in which the objects are positioned in space. Um, we term this that they are um, they form geometric graphs. They are, um, yeah. So, for example, uh, nodes in objects in the traffic scene are positioned in space, in the Euclidean space. Um, Within modeling uh, interacting systems of objects, uh, future forecasting is a fundamental task. So in future uh, forecasting, uh, our uh, inputs uh, are a set of trajectories. So in this particular example, we have uh, a schematic with two cars and a bicycle uh, that are uh, moving in space. Um, and our goal is to predict the future trajectories. Uh, our inputs are uh, the positions and the velocities, uh, and we can have additional inputs, uh, such as accelerations, uh, angular uh, positions or orientations, um, as well as external uh, information, such as the maps, um, which are often used in, um, in trajectory forecasting for autonomous driving. And uh, also, we're interested in modeling systems that operate, um, that do not operate in isolation, but instead interact with one another. Um, I will, uh, is everything clear so far um, with the introduction of the topic? Yeah, maybe. Can I'm not we... monitoring the question, so. Uh, Maybe you can let me know if. Yeah. So in the chat, we also have the question what do interacting particles mean? Like, if we have a molecule, for example, we have the atoms, and why would some atoms be interacting and some atoms not be interacting with each other? Like, we, yeah, maybe they are a little bit further apart and will interact less, but they're still interacting. Right. So what yes. sort of latent graph do we want to learn for a molecule? Yes, indeed. Uh, so in theory, um, 
like for example, in the charge particles that I'm showing here, uh, this data set is using the uh, Coulomb's law, uh, electrostatic forces. And indeed, the particles are always uh, interacting with one another with an um, inverse square law. Um, but uh, so in a way, the graph will always be fully connected. Uh, but um, yeah, we can, this does not make it less of a graph, of course. Um, and um, it often makes sense to, uh, to prune the graph, uh, given that from a certain point onwards, the interactions are so negligible that uh, yeah. we don't have to model. Yeah, them. right. As you said, inverse square. So after some distant... Uh, yeah, so for example, in the figure that I'm showing here, which is a 3D uh, set of particles, you can see that the... Um, the green and the brown red is uh, particles are um, sort of going straight because they are too far away from anything else to have a meaningful interaction. Well, on the other hand, the two, the blue and the cyan are spiraling. Uh, yeah. Against each other. But even if we assume that um, the graph is fully connected, uh, and then we can still use a graph network or um, a transformer or something like that, right? Um, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, uh, neural relational inference uh, is a very uh, well known uh, model uh, for uh, modeling uh, interacting dynamical systems. Uh, this work was uh, uh, is from uh, Thomas Kiff, Ethan Vitaya et al. Um, and uh, neural relational inference, or NRI for short, uh, explicitly infers uh, the graph structure um, of latent edge types and simultaneously learns the dynamical system. Uh, in order to do so, uh, they formulate their uh, model as a, a variational autoencoder in which the encoder is uh, tasked with uh, predicting the, the graph structure, the edges. Um, and the decoder um, operates on this, um, on the predicted graph structure in order to um, predict the next, um, type, the next stage. Um, I, I think maybe I can go in a bit more detail uh, on this. Uh, so, um, in the encoder, uh, we're operating uh, on a fully connected graph. Uh, fully connect, uh, it's a, uh, in, this, in the paper they use, I think, a two-layer uh, message passing neural network. Um, and at the output um, of the encoder, we have the posterior distribution over latent edge types. Um, the number of edge types uh, is a hyperparameter, can be uh, changed according to the experiment. So for example, uh, if we, in the charged particles uh, example that I mentioned, um, if we, given that we know that we have either a positive or a negative uh, charge, or rather uh, an attractive or repulsive force, uh, we can use two, like, two edge types. Um, in other cases that we do not know uh, what could be the, the edge types, interactions between object pairs, uh, we can use an arbitrary uh, number of edge types. Uh, and in the paper, they also uh, use one edge type to denote the absence of interactions, which would sparsify the graph. Um, now, in order to uh, sample edge types uh, and create uh, a graph structure. Uh, they use the Gumbel softmax trick in the paper. Um, and in the decoder, uh, having sampled the, this graph structure, um, again, they use uh, a graph network, a similar <coughs> graph network. For, uh, yeah, for the, for the Gumbel softmax trick, like, do we really just take the activations of the network and put them into the logarithm and then add them, or do we do anything with the activations before that? Um, you mean if there's a, a nonlinearity or something like that? 
maybe a sigmoid to for between zero and one, you know. Um, to be honest, I'm not I'm not sure about that. Um, let me think. I don't think there's anything there, but um, I will have to check it okay. again to be sure. Um, oh well, then the decoder. Yes, so the decoder um, uh, is using the the graph structure that we have inferred or that we have sampled uh, in the encoder, uh, and again we have a very simple, um, it's actually one layer graph network. Um, that outputs um, the displacement. Actually, if you see at the end of the um, of the figure, the right part of the figure, we're predicting this delta x, uh, which is very common in uh, trajectory forecasting. We're not predicting the uh, the positions and the velocity for the next time step, but rather we're predicting uh, the the delta x or the delta velocity. Uh, and then we're using a simple forward uh, Euler integration or perhaps something more fancy, but uh, in terms of uh, an integrator. Can you, uh, yeah, can you maybe say a few words about that? Because what EGNN, for example, isn't doing that, right? Uh, they're just predicting the, the next coordinates. Uh, no, actually, EGNN in the, um, in the experiment uh, on charged particles, they are uh, they are incorporate the velocity in the experiments. Uh, so uh, instead of predicting, um, they, they 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 have the in the appendix they have the, the changed equations. Uh, so they predict the velocity and then they do exactly uh, uh, the same. So they predict the velocities and then they uh, have pretty much like a residual connection. Uh, like xt plus one equals xt uh, plus velocity of t. Um, okay, so the if they use the EGNN for the, so the point cloud doesn't only uh, evolve through the uh, position changes in the EGNN, but the point cloud also evolves by some um, some velocities that are predicted in the in the very end. Yes, yes. So it's um, it's node in GNN, uh, even in our work to end in our app, um, is uh, described by its position, whether in two or three dimensions, uh, plus uh, the velocity. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but usually if we have an EGNN, right, we have like eight layers maybe, and we have um, eight position changes and now we also ha have eight velocity changes right and is this now if you're doing your simulation with 25 steps do you just have 25 EGNN layers uh, I'm not sure I follow the question so uh, in EGNN if you have um, eight layers like you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, all the velocities that are predicted in the hidden layers so let's say Yes, uh, they're not the output of the network, but rather they are some sort of hidden uh, state uh, positions and velocities. Yes, but each each layer changes the velocities in a non-hidden way, right? And the the um, and the coordinates in a non-hidden way. So, do you actually use the coordinates of these eight layers? Or do you only use the final velocity predictions of the um, of the EGNN? Uh, the final. Okay, good. Yeah, I, I mean you could have chained it together, right? For example, like uh, that each uh, each layers changes. Yeah, they are one change step in your dynamical system as well. But what you're doing is that. Um, the or what uh, you're doing with the EGNN or and they as well maybe I don't know uh, is that you only take the yeah only take the final prediction of the EGNN to mm -hmm. as one update step in the in the dynamical system and all the other update steps in the EGNN they don't play play a role yeah so we're intermediate. Uh outputs uh, as uh, hidden states. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's what they, they also uh, do, and that's uh, in Sorry, a way. I don't know that they. No, no, no. But, uh, but um, uh, yeah, in a way, they are, we can say that they are latent positions in the lower stage. Yeah. Um, or something like that. Uh, but indeed, you can do what you uh, described um, and treat each uh, output of it, the output of each layer as uh, a time step. That, that's what you suggest, right? Yeah. Yeah, indeed, you, you can probably do that. Uh, or I think uh, you can also maybe use something like a neural ID to, um, to do this. They did that in the most recent paper. So that you basically only then have one layer. Yes. One EGNN layer that you just apply a bunch of times. OK. Um, yeah, Oops. so in, in um, uh, I should mention that in NRI, um, uh, they also have a different uh, type of decoder. Um, so in settings that uh, the Markov property holds, uh, mm -hmm. such as um, physics simulations. Uh, they use the Markov uh, decoder, which is the one that I described. Uh, but uh, in settings that we have some sort of uh, memory in the system, uh, for example, in motion capture, I think we have an experiment in motion capture, um, in which uh, previous states, not just from the previous time, uh, affect the output. Uh, they um, have a different decoder, which also uses a GRU update okay. or an RM yeah. update more. And they, they also predict multiple steps into the future, right? And you don't. Did I get that right? Uh, in NRI? During training. Sorry? During training, they predict multiple states into the future and you just predict one. Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. During, during training in our work, we followed well, DNRI, which I will uh, present in a minute, um, and we followed the exact uh, same training uh, regime, okay. uh, which, which indeed uses uh, so like full uh, teacher forcing and just predicts. Um, then, I mean, we do not predict the next time step, but we use full teacher forcing. Uh, okay. Yeah, which is similar, but it's not exactly the same. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so um, DNRI, which I just mentioned, Dynamic Neural Rational Inference uh, by Graber et al., uh, is a, an extension to uh, NRI that was proposed um, in order to uh, actually to, to model dynamic relations. So NRI uh, can only model um, relations that are static uh, through time. For example, in the charged particles uh, setting that we uh, have been talking about, um, a, a pair of particles either repel or attract uh, one another. Uh, they do not, this relationship is constant through time. Uh, but in many practical uh, applications, uh, the, inter the interactions between object pairs change through time. Uh, one example uh, setting that they have in this paper is uh, a basketball setting, uh, modeling the trajectories of basketball players. Uh, so the interactions between pairs of uh, players of opposing teams uh, change through time. Um, so in order to be able to uh, model uh, dynamically evolving relations, uh, DNRA introduces um, a sequential approximate posterior. They, they call it uh, prior in uh, the paper, but I find uh, the naming quite confusing. Um, so the, the idea is as follows. Um, I will go from left to right and explain the figure. Uh, so the, the inputs, the input X is the input states, positions and velocities for all nodes. Uh, the input states are being processed um, for its time step independently by a fully connected graph neural network. The graph neural network outputs edge embeddings for each node pair. Then uh, during training, um, these edge embeddings are being, are being fed to two different LSTMs. Uh, the first one is the, the prior, uh, so-called prior, uh, and the other one they call it encoder. 
but I find the name a bit confusing. Um, so if you see the arrows, um, you will notice that one goes uh, forward in time while the other goes backwards in time. Uh, the idea is that um, we want the encoder LSTM uh, to guide uh, the prior LSTM. Uh, because in uh, because during inference we only use the prior LSTM, uh, but we want to to guide it during training, uh, and uh, the LST encoder LSTM uh, has some sort of oracle information, given that it knows about the future. Uh, so after uh, the edge embeddings are being processed uh, by the LSTM. Uh, we have uh, an MLP uh, that outputs uh, the approximate posterior. And again, we use the, they use uh, the Gumbel softmax uh, trick to sample relations. And uh, the decoder is uh, identical, almost identical to uh, NRI, uh, but this time uh, the graph is different at this time step. Other than that, uh, they use again the Markov decoder in the when the Markov property holds, and they use a recurrent decoder uh, in all other settings. Uh, is everything clear so far? Um, From my side, yep. Okay, should I move on then? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, and then another um, uh, related work uh, by Sadra Setal uh, is uh, EGNN, uh, EN Equivariant Graph Neural Networks. Um, a very simple, a very elegant and clean and <laughs> uh, idea that works very well. Um, so uh, the, the key idea behind EGNN uh, was to introduce equivariance to uh, translations, rotations, and reflections uh, using quantities, uh, node quantities or edge quantities that are uh, naturally um, invariant or equivariant. Uh, so um, to that end, uh, they leverage uh, the Euclidean distances between node pairs uh, that are um, by design uh, translation invariant, rotation invariant, and reflection invariant. And um, they create uh, a novel uh, graph neural network. Uh, actually, they create a new graph neural network layer and then graph ne network that uh, uses these layers um, to predict, uh, well, in, our, in the settings that are most relevant to us, to predict, again, the future trajectories. But they also have some uh, other experiments on um, a chemical data set, uh, if I recall correctly, and uh, another data set that um, I don't remember, to be honest. Um, yeah, this, this is very interesting work. Um, and uh, similar to EGNN, um, one, of our, uh, one of the key motivations for our work uh, is uh, the question what happens when we um, rotate or translate the inputs. So uh, if we were to uh, rotate or translate the inputs, uh, such as the uh, example that I show on the uh, bottom left, um, we would expect uh, both intuitively and uh, based on uh, some lot of the natural world that uh, the future trajectories should uh, rotate and translate accordingly. Now this uh, property uh, is called rotor translation equivariance, uh, meaning that uh, the dynamics do not change or change equivalently uh, under rotations and translations. Another key motivation for our work um, is uh, the observation that uh, objects often operate uh, in egocentric uh, views of the world, which are all, uh, oftentimes are also asymmetric. 
Uh, for example, if we uh, look at uh, the figure uh, on the top, um, we have the same scene, uh, but viewed uh, from um, two different perspectives. So the left one is viewed from the perspective of the, the circled pedestrian. Uh, while the uh, right um, is viewed from the, the perspective of the square pedestrian. Um, now, the, the second uh, scene um, is identical to the first one, but has been canonicalized, has been rotated so that um, it's uh, so that the pedestrian, the square pedestrian, is facing right. So if you <laughs> if you tilt your head. Uh, they are uh, exactly the same, uh, but viewed from a, each one is viewed from the perspective of the target pedestrian. Um, however, in practice, um, actually, yeah. Um, another uh, important point is the, the, the asymmetric uh, perspective that um, objects often have. Um, this means that uh, if we uh, look at the coordinate frame, or the, the perspective of, the, of each pedestrian, um, pedestrians treat right and left different than uh, front and back or up and down in three dimensions. Um, this is very important in traffic scene settings, in settings for autonomous driving, uh, because, for example, we have um, asymmetric traffic rules. We have the priority to the right traffic rule. Um, also, uh, people uh, tend to uh, focus more on what's on their front rather than what's on their back, uh, to which we pay little to no attention. Um, yeah, however, uh, in practice, the majority of works um, uh, embeds uh, the graphs and the nodes and its nodes in arbitrary uh, global coordinate frames and does not leverage the, the egocentric perspectives of the objects. Um, are we uh, clear? Do, are there any questions? Um, yeah, so didn't you just say that we basically, <laughs> yeah, we can't use the egocentric view because even though in like there could be cases where the egocentric a view would work if we didn't have this left right distinguishing here for example then it would work but if we do have something like that yeah then we can't just always like for every node in a graph for example have a have the egocentric view because um yeah we we, we will still have an, an arbitrary choice uh, I'm not sure I follow the question. Can you yeah. please uh, repeat? Like, what is it that? What are you trying to say with the left and right? That orientation is important, right? And that it's it might not be preserved when we do our uh, when we change the coordinates, the, the coordinates. Uh, okay, so when we um, when we use global coordinate frames, um, in principle. Uh, a neural network, web network can learn uh, to distinguish uh, these egocentric perspectives. Um, we can employ the uh, universal approximation theorem and be done with it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that doesn't give us much. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the idea is that um, uh, when we have um, uh, let me put it another way. Uh, in um, in a traffic in a in a traffic scene setting, uh, we could have uh, scenes that are uh, here in Amsterdam, over there at Munich, um, and so on and so forth. If we were to use the uh, global coordinates, like the the latitude and the longitude, um, uh, we would have entirely different representations. Yes. Okay. Good. But. Like what you want to do in the end, right, is that instead of something like an EGNN where we change coordinates or velocities, yeah, where we always just, we don't do anything with the inputs in the beginning, but then we just 
always change the like each change that we make to the coordinates and the velocities is done in an equivariant way but now what you do instead is that you put everything into a special coordinates frame like for for each object itself and then you can feed that to whatever you want and then for what you get out you need to do the canonicalization backwards again mm -hmm. right yeah and so for example if i maybe have a um i don't know if i have a molecule that is a point or that has a okay no it's now it's going to bad ideas but if i have a cat picture and i always canonicalize my my cat picture to be looking to the right then I can train my network to be invariant with respect to which direction cats are looking. That's correct. It's the thing you want to do. Um, yeah, and then we can have some something equivariant by just turning in the beginning, then putting the thing through our network, and then undoing our turn as much as we needed to do it in the beginning to have the canonicalization. But yes, uh, let's go. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Isn't it kind of, yeah, maybe you can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, there we have this, this thing right here. And okay, yeah, maybe just explain this first and then we, okay, then okay. we get into But it. But just to uh, make a quick, uh, to answer really quickly about the, the cat example, um, if we had a way, uh, to uh, rotate the cat to a, the same angular, uh, the same angle, um, then why not do it? Uh, the, the, the problem is that we don't uh, have this information, uh, but, but here in this setting we have, or in some other settings we might have too. Um, but okay, um, let me... Yeah, for the cat, we have nothing canonical that we can say, like, Okay, we could take the way that it's the direction it is looking. If we always only have like a schematic of a cat that is, yeah, okay, whatever. But <laughs> the, um, but here now the canonical thing that we can take those are the velocities. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I'm just <laughs> asking. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. Let me um, let me go through this uh, couple of slides to present the main idea and then we can uh, uh, have a, an extended discussion on it okay um yeah so um motivated by uh, these uh, observations um we propose uh, to model objects in an interacting system uh, using local coordinate frames so in this example uh, we have uh, four objects um, and uh, that are embedded in a global coordinate frame. And the arrows uh, represent the velocities. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be the velocities. Uh, it can be any other intrinsic uh, angular information. So for example, it could be the accelerations. It could be um, the, 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 the Euler angles. Uh, if you have them or if, if they exist because in some things they don't even exist um yeah so but in this work uh because they are widely available we use the velocities okay so, sorry sorry but yeah in your in your paper when you go ahead and you introduce your your note as having a direction um your your note as having a position a velocity and then you say it also has an angle, then mm -hmm. you just set that angle equal to some quantity determined by the velocities, right? Yes. Okay, so the, the velocities are completely ignored in the end, except for, yeah, uh, even the speed, no. No, the velocities are not ignored, why? Uh... Yeah, if we just have the orientations and the orientations are... No, we keep the velocities, but instead of using the quote unquote, actual uh, angular positions. Uh, they're not always available. Um, we, we use uh, the velocities to approximate 
the angular positions. We keep the velocities intact as a, uh, a feature, let's say, of the known, but we also um, use the velocities to approximate the angular positions. Yeah, okay, but we, if we want to apply this thing to, like we couldn't use this, for example, for molecules that we just put, uh, for atoms that we just put in space, and then we want to know what happens to them. We need some velocity, or we need some arbitrary um, direction thing for each um, object in our mm -hmm. in our. Yes, indeed, uh, no, I'm not an expert in the, the the molecular settings, but I've seen a, a few, at least a few works that use some uh, extremes external um, angle angle information, right? Uh, like the dihedral angles or or these kinds of things. Yeah, uh, but the... yeah. But now what we're saying uh, is that yeah, in this setting, this particular setting that we have here, we have an intrinsic uh, way to do it. Um, I am not sure whether such uh, a quantity would exist in uh, in the in the molecular setting. Like, yeah. Is there an intrinsic um, angle to the atom? To the maybe, maybe if we have like the we we have the spin of each atom for some reason or something like that, but I don't think so. Yeah, it could could be. I, I'm not an expert, so I I can't really say uh, with certainty. But um, yeah, the the even uh, an an um, an idea would be even to um, to predict this in an equivalent way um, to predict. Uh, a preferred uh, orientation in which we would, uh, it doesn't have to be a correct one. Uh, what we postulate here is that uh, it doesn't really matter much whether it's um, the velocity. Okay, but rate. let's maybe uh, just get into what you do here. Like you move ah. it into the center ah. and then okay. rotate. Yes, yes. So uh, the idea is that we have uh, one local coordinate frame for each object uh, and, and for its time step, but let's uh, focus on one snaps for now. Um, yeah, so the way, okay, I will focus on this uh, yellow uh, pentagon object for clarity. Um, so it, we construct, in, in order to construct the local coordinate frames, um, we first, uh, mathematically, we first uh, translate, translate to the center of the local coordinate frame along with everything else, every, every neighbor. Um, and then uh, we perform a rotation such that uh, the orientation of the target uh, object is zero. Uh, again, rotating uh, everything else uh, along with it. And uh, yeah, we perform this operation for all uh, objects. In the in the uh, in the interacting system. Uh, Just yeah. very simple question. Like uh, you can do that because you're 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 doing the translation using the position information you have, and then this velocity information that you've got is used for the rotation. So so when you said you could kind of pick something arbitrary, I mean you could predict it. You know maybe the velocity itself isn't important. It's it's really you just want some consistent way of rotating each each vector into a sort of canonical state. I mean, canonical direction, I guess, is, is, is the, the rotation. Mm -hmm. Is that right? OK. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, as long as uh, you have uh, an intrinsic node quantity that is uh, equivalent, to the yes. rotation equivalent, you could use it. Uh, it yeah. may be the case that uh, one, one potential issue um, would be um, for example, if we were to use uh, the, the fourth derivative of the velocity, okay, this mm -hmm. would probably be zero in most settings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you have, if everything is zero, then the, your rotations are trivial. So it wouldn't make yeah. a difference. So you, need, uh, you would need a quantity um, that is not zero. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's intrinsic. And, and, and in these simple settings where you have access to position and velocity, you use velocity to uh, velocity vector for the rotation and mm -hmm. position for the translation. 
even in uh, I mean in most settings, not all of them, but in most set in most uh, uh, data sets that we experiment on, uh, even the velocities are not directly available. It's just that we use the the difference of two consecutive uh, time steps uh, to get them. I mean, I think only for in the um, no, even even for it in the but in an autonomous driving setting, you might have uh, at least the ego velocity, for example, the velocity of the car uh, measured by an actual speed meter. But other than that, usually we have the, the velocity as a difference of two consecutive uh, times. Okay. That makes sense. All right, um, Hannes, do you want to uh, <laughs> to continue the discussion that we uh, paused for a minute there? Um, I don't know what it about. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know what's what what's still unclear or there. So uh, okay, if I uh, make one more, um, if I, I will try to answer one more of the questions that you posed. Uh, yeah. earlier um so uh, one uh, difference one big difference with uh, egnn is that egnn um uh, actually makes use of uh, this rotation invariant quantities uh, like the Euclidean distance uh, which is an invariant quantity uh, it cannot um, differentiate differentiate between the left and right that i mentioned before so even though in a way um there is the, the notion of the local frame, uh, just the translation part. Um, yeah, there is no notion of uh, egocentric uh, view or uh, differentiating between uh, left, right, uh, and so on. Uh, you just use the, the distances as uh, this is the main, uh, one of the main differences at least. Okay, so for EGNN, like we don't, um, when we're getting a message from a neighbor, then we don't know if the, like if we have a neighbor here and a neighbor here, it doesn't matter that one neighbor is here and one neighbor is here, they might as well just be like this or like this, it won't make a difference. Only in the in the messages between these two neighbors, mm -hmm. there will be a difference. That's you what mean, you're saying. You mean there's? Uh, I, I'm sure, I'm not sure I understand, but uh, yeah, that's that's quite close to what I mean. Uh, for EGNN, right? <laughs> um, Your example was for EGNN. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then it doesn't make. Um, I mean, it's not exactly like that. If you have. Uh, two nodes like this. It's the same as having them like that. Uh, yes, that is the, uh, that's the that's the same in terms of translation. But it's also for EGNN. If we just have like a star graph now, if we have it like this, it's the same as if we had it like this. Yes, right? but in in the two top nodes, the the relative distance would be yeah different. okay. But there is no. Uh, no connection there because ah, yeah okay okay then, then, yeah, graph then, yeah, then yeah, the same. okay yeah but in what and there in in egnn we basically need two message passing steps if we have the completely connected graph to have a difference between this and between this and it, meanwhile in your thingy we know that if something is cha changes the there is in a different direction because yeah, you yeah, you always just input the coordinates themselves, right? But you before you input the coordinates, you move them into some canonicalized uh, yes. positions. Okay. And yeah, just to be sure, um, we're now if we're aggregating messages for the let's say the top left uh, node like in the top left mm -hmm. uh, the star if we're aggregating messages from for the star then what we do is to just put uh, everything into the canonical frame of the star and then use the positions of everything as the input yes the positions and the velocity yes yeah uh, okay. uh... And then if we aggregate messages for the triangle, then we just put stuff into the canonical frame of the triangle and aggregate messages. Exactly. Okay. 
exactly cool yeah now i understand why this um has like more information than egn I, i don't know if it's more information but it's uh it's more accessible so it's yeah more clear egn you have to do two message passing steps for this particular example for example <laughs> yeah good all right um now uh, in practice uh we uh built upon uh the uh, nri and the nri that i mentioned earlier um but i i, will, I have to uh note however that in principle uh, our model can be incorporated in any uh graph neural network that uh has nodes positioned in space and evolving through time um so if uh we have a geometric graph as we term it um meaning that the nodes are positioned in uh euclidean space or, or in space in general uh and are evolving through time so if there's a notion of um velocity or something like that uh then our um our method can be directly incorporated uh but in, in practice we uh build upon uh, nri and dnri more specifically um and uh the pipeline is uh, as follows it closely follows uh dnri so um the at each time step the the bold phase x denotes the positions and velocities in the global coordinate uh, frame so um at each time step uh the input states are being converted from the global coordinate frame to the local coordinate frame of each object then similarly to dnri we uh have we perform uh we have a graph neural network a fully connected graph neural network uh that outputs edge embeddings and then we have the same uh lstm architecture as before uh, i'm only here i'm only showing the uh the inference uh pipeline for uh for clarity uh but the this this lstm updates the edge embeddings over time uh and the output of this lstm uh, is the approximate posterior um and again for the decoder uh we have a similar uh principle uh so the nodes are being uh transformed from the global coordinate frame to the local coordinate frames the local coordinate frame of each object and then we uh use the gamble softmax trick to sample um the the graph structure uh and uh yeah use a graph network with the this sampled graph structure and uh, similarly to dnri uh we predict uh or and nri um we don't predict directly uh the state for the next time step but instead we predict this delta x or the delta uh, velocity um but these uh, these predictions are predictions are in the local coordinate frame of each object so in order to uh transform the predictions back to the global coordinate frame we perform an inverse transformation uh so an inverse rotation and translation uh and convert our predictions back to the global coordinate frame um yeah so um another uh benefit uh that we uh that we get from these uh, local coordinate frames um is that uh we get an uh, inherent notion of directionality uh which uh allows for um anisotropic filtering in uh, um nri and dnri sorry Hannes. yeah that, that's the difference that we talked about right with two egn and for example yes okay. yes i i was waiting to show this uh, slide yeah but sorry to jump forward um yeah so uh in um in nri and dnri uh, they, they don't use graph convolutions they have a, a message passing network um, meaning that the update is uh, a neural network uh, a neural network but uh, in this in our work we have um, actual 
actual convolutions, let's say, so linear operators uh, in the um, in the message passing step. Uh, but since uh, we operate in the local coordinate frames, uh, we can introduce anisotropic filters. And the way we do that is that we um, introduce a filter uh, generating network that takes as inputs the relative positions and uh, orientations of neighbors and, uh, and predicts filters uh, for each of those neighbors. Uh, two uh, examples to uh, showcase the, uh, the idea. Uh, in the top right, we have uh, a filter uh, that has high activations uh, within close proximity from the, uh, the y-axis, uh, but uh, remains constant along the x-axis. Um, one example uh, where such a filter could be useful would be uh, in uh, a highway setting in autonomous driving, for example, in which we want to pay close attention to um, our, uh, the car that is in front of us or the car that's behind us, uh, but we don't pay much attention uh, to our left and right. While on the other hand, on the, on the bottom right uh, figure, um, an example that has high activations on the front and right of the target object, uh, which again, if we uh, were to use uh, um, a traffic example, uh, would be uh, perhaps useful in a set. It would be useful because of the priority to the right traffic rule. So if someone was on the right, uh, it, this, this filter could be useful. Of course, this um, the filters that I'm showing here are only uh, dependent on the, the relative positions um, and not on the orientations due to uh, visualization. But in principle, we have a filter that's also um, uh, related to, that's also uh, dependent on the orientations. For example, we could have uh, an, a neighbor that's on the front and right of the target object uh, going upwards. So this would mean that perhaps this object should have priority uh, in, in the traffic scene. Um, all right, uh, before I move on to the experiments, uh, there's one more part in the paper which I don't, uh, I haven't uh, addressed in the slides. Uh, and it's um, uh, the, the, the idea of the normalization. Um, so in, uh, in, the, in, in the preprocessing, I mean, uh, in NRI and DNRI, um, in most, if not in, in the experiments, um, they use min max normalization, which is a pretty standard um, technique to normalize uh, the data. Uh, however, uh, if we were if you were to um, perform such normalization uh, while uh, paying attention to the geometry um, of the problem, uh, it, uh, it would mean that uh, you're sort of messing up the, the geometry uh, because you're performing such an operation uh, in an anisotropic um, way, meaning that you change the directions. Uh, and uh, this is something that we do not want. Um, so instead of using a min max normalization or Z score normalization, um, we uh, use a very simple uh, alternative. Uh, we propose a very simple alternative, um, which is uh, simply uh, scaling uh, the, the data, the states of the objects uh, by the maximum speed uh, that is available in its data set, in the training set of its data set. Um, and uh, this very simple uh, normalization seems to help a lot. Yeah, you also have some... Uh some graphs on that, right? Will they come up? You mean the results? Yeah, where you just have to graphs for the normalization, where you do it or you don't. Uh, I don't have the ablation uh, results on the slides, okay. uh, but maybe we can jump on the paper uh, yeah. later, right? I mean, you already said everything, right? It helps. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, can you go back to the anisotropic and isotropic filtering like I now don't we already have a notion of directionality even without your anisotropic filtering if we just have the coordinates as an input because we yeah 
because it's already different. If if you have uh, only the uh, let's say the translation in the local coordinate frame, uh, you can uh, use anisotropic, but uh, only if there was some sort of uh, radial symmetry. So, for example, um, a paper comes to mind for from molecular uh, experiments. Uh, SCH net. I don't know if how to pronounce it. Um, uh, which uh, used sort of similar uh, idea, um, but with, um, with RBF kernels. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you had this, uh, only the translation, uh, you could have some sort of anisotropic filtering, but only uh, with a radial symmetry. So concentric circles uh, from the Do center. Do you mean with the translation? Like, what do you mean with having the translation? I mean, I, I mean, if you were uh, only using the uh, the relative positions uh, to it, when you use the relative positions, uh, for example, in EGNN, you have so, you have the translation invariance or equivariance, um, and then when you do when we do as we do the rotation, uh, you have also the rotation uh, equivariance or invariance. Um, so when you do, uh, that, that was the question, right? About um, all the yeah. Okay, but you can see the, the stuff that I'm drawing here. Yes. Right? Yeah, if instead the, the orange thingy is over here, mm -hmm. then this would have a different X coordinate, right? And we we still have the same the same distance here, but we, we have another direction. But we have, because we have another direction, we have another X coordinate and the directionality is already captured. So Wait, ah, okay, okay, uh, maybe I got confused. So, are you talking about the scenario in which we have the um, the rotation canonicalization as well? Yes. Uh, okay, so the the cent the target node is facing rightwards, it, as in this, right? Are it, you talking about such a scenario? But yes. Okay, so all neighbor is different. The, the let's say the the pentagon uh, neighbor is the only thing that's different. Y yes. No, I'm just trying to uh, to capture the scenario. Uh, yeah, we have this scenario right here. We're mm -hmm. we have a canonicalized framework. We do your two canonicalization steps, mm -hmm. and then we I would say that we already capture all of the directionality. And why do we additionally need this uh, this new MLP? that takes the relative positions and orientations and gives us another notion of directionality again. If we just feed the, the coordinates as input at the very beginning, then we already know about the direction, don't we? Okay, the, the idea is that if we were to use um, uh, a, simple, a GCN, a simple graph convolutional network, uh, yeah. within the local coordinate frames, uh, then we would have only one set of weights, right? One weight matrix, that's it. Okay, uh, okay. So, so this uh, would be an isotropic, uh, an example of isotropic, of, of isotropic filtering. Uh, we have one set of weights, so we can't really differentiate okay. uh, good, good. a lot of things. Uh, but if, we... if you were to have uh, an MLP instead, so not just a linear transformation of the neighbors, uh, then yes, an MLP can do um, anything. Um, but this is uh, sort of a linear, uh, it, it's a linear uh, filtering, so it's an actual convolution. Uh, so it has the benefits of that. Uh, I mean, I see the point that it's a more direct encoding of the direction, but we still, we already have it, right? If we uh, put it into the representation of this, of this node right here, it is, um, and people are starting to erase my stuff, I think. Damn. Uh, yeah, if we have the representation of this node, this one, then it already depends on its location, right? Mm -hmm. And we, if, it, if this embedding depends on its location, because the location depends on the uh, orientation, so of the, it is not um, isotropic, 
then the message that we will be passing to this node right here, it will also already depend on the direction. But okay, the the the, the thing, the issue is um, how we uh, aggregate neighbor information in order to create a new node embedding. Oh yes, 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 yes. Okay. okay. We don't so know which uh, which node the message is coming from. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so if you if you think about the the simplest GCN architecture um, in the, in its dense form, you have like the, the adjacency matrix uh, times the weight matrix times the node embeddings. Okay. Um, but um, th this weight matrix is a single uh, matrix and cannot differentiate yeah. the different neighbors. But now uh, we have filters that are uh, depending on uh, yeah the positions and orientations, as you said. Yeah, okay, absolutely clear. I don't know why I struggled so much with that. <laughs> Thanks. Perhaps I didn't explain it <laughs> properly. Uh, but I'm glad you, uh, you understood. All right, um, then some experiments, some results. Yeah. Um, yes, all right, uh, let's uh, jump on the experiments. So we performed um, experiments on a number of uh, 2D and 3D settings. Actually, <laughs> uh, before I uh, move on to the um, experiments uh, I forgot one to mention one more thing so um, because we use the velocities to approximate uh, the orientations um, uh, this means that in three dimensions uh, we do not have exact equivalence but we have other equivalence leakage um, because in three dimensions you need three angles to uh, have the full orientation uh, of an object uh, but using the velocity or any other intrinsic vector, for that matter, um, can only give you two out of the three um, rotations or orientations. Sorry. Uh, so that means that we have a leakage. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, we perform uh, experiments in a number of uh, settings, uh, 2D and 3D. Um, first, we will start with a synthetic data set that was proposed by DNRI. Um, we, uh, then we perform uh, experiments on ND, which is uh, a data set with uh, traffic scenes, pedestrians, cars, bicycles, and so on, uh, to, in two dimensions. Um, we extend the charged particles setting um, similar to EGNN to three dimensions, and we perform an experiment on 3D charged particles. And we also perform uh, uh, an experiment on the CMU motion capture data set, which is also 3D. Um, yeah, we compare against NRI, DNRI, uh, and EGNN, and in ND, uh, we'll compare against uh, a simple uh, GRU baseline. Um, we run all, in all uh, experiments, uh, in all settings, we run the tests uh, for five different random initialization sheets and report the mean and standard deviation. Um, yeah, so in, in uh, all uh, settings, um, I'm going to outperform the competitors uh, in many cases by a large margin. Uh, and uh, also shows um, a much lower uh, deviation across um, seeds. Um, on the synthetic data set, we also um, perform an experiment following DNRI and measure um, the relation prediction uh, score. Uh, so very briefly, the synthetic data set is a very simple uh, data set with three particles, uh, as shown on the uh, figure on the left. Uh, two of the particles, uh, the red particles, are moving uh, with constant uh, velocity. Uh, and one of them uh, is also initialized with constant velocity, uh, but uh, is uh, being uh, uh, repulsive forces are being exerted to it uh, when it um, approaches one of the other two. Um, so the, these lines that you're drawing here, are those actually the edges that are being predicted by NRI? Uh, or, yeah, by your mo model? By the, uh, no, uh, these are not, okay. uh, these, uh, this figure is from the NRI. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they are the ground truth ones, to be honest, or what's predicted by uh, uh, by DNRI. 
Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we measure the relation predict the, the F1 score uh, on relation prediction. And again, uh, our method can, uh, the F1 score uh, is uh, 28 <laughs> points uh, greater than uh, the NRI. Uh, finally, uh, I have some uh, couple of qualitative results. Um, so these are um, on uh, of the charged particles data set. Uh, on uh, a quite uh, hard uh, example. Um, so uh, as you can see, our uh, method can create more uh, robust trajectories, more plausible trajectories. Um, so for example, in the uh, interactions between the blue and the cyan particle, um, we see that uh, NRI and DNRI almost completely fail uh, in this very hard example. Uh, while EGNN uh, can capture uh, the spiraling action, uh, but tends to deviate quite quickly, while our method can uh, create a good uh, and reliable uh, predictions uh, far ahead in the future. And finally, on ND, I uh, have a few uh, examples. Um, so again, uh, we see that our method can create more uh, reliable uh, trajectories, while uh, EGNN and DNRI uh, tend to overshoot uh, the predicted trajectories uh, by a lot. Um, in conclusion, uh, let me, are there any questions? Uh, should I? Yeah, like from, from my side, everything's clear, but. Okay, okay, let me conclude and then we can uh, yeah. have a further discussion. Have further questions. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, in this work, we uh, introduce local coordinate frames for all objects in the geometric graph of an interacting uh, system. These local coordinate frames are uh, translated uh, and rotated um, to match the position and the orientation of, of each target object. These uh, local coordinate frames grant us invariance uh, and equivariance to global uh, rotations and translations. Furthermore, um, the local coordinate frames can inherently capture directionality and allow us to introduce anisotropic and continuous filters based on uh, relative positions and orientations of neighboring objects. We demonstrate the effectiveness of our method in a range of uh, 2D and 3D settings. Our source code uh, is available. Uh, thankfully, <laughs> I uh, managed to make it public a week ago or so. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, definitely. We have, no, no, no. let me not say the questions first. Let me say thanks for the yeah, for this discussion first. We, uh, yeah, the, the clap by Jason, thanks. Uh, sorry that. Yeah. No one else can clap okay. and say thanks because everyone has to be muted. Uh, okay, but I can ask to unmute. But before we have Jason's question, let's maybe have the question from the chat. How does this technique compare to DMD or KAF? Like, do you know these methods? Uh, the acronym doesn't ring a bell, so... Um... Uh, is what you're doing spatio-temporal forecasting? Uh, if you could uh, send me the papers, uh, because the, mm, I mean, yeah, okay, the, the term spatio-temporal forecasting is quite vague. Um, yeah, okay, so, I mean, um, then let's not so, get into that, right? So I'm not sure, uh, but the, the acronyms do not ring a bell. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. But is what you're doing, is that called like the dynamic system prediction stuff? Is that called spatial temporal forecasting? Um, I would say so, yes. But okay. uh, the same term could be used, be used perhaps for weather prediction or something like that. Uh, so it's quite an, an umbrella term. Um, yeah. Good. But then, Jason. Yeah. Um, yeah, really nice talk. Thanks. Uh, uh, this is very minor comment, but you'll probably, if you if you're interested, you'd probably enjoy Jeff Hawkins' um, Thousand Brains book. I've just kind of read it for fun, interest's sake. But he kind of firmly believes that that the 
the whole kind of key to understanding intelligence is is modeling everything in terms of local coordinate frames. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, like, I literally just read it, and it's sort of fun to sort of finish reading that book and watch your talk, which is <laughs> which is very much a sort of an architectural view on that. So not directly relevant at all, but yeah. I think I think you'd probably enjoy reading it. No, no, um, ooh, indeed. Uh, I, I mean, we mentioned in the paper, but. Um, yeah, the, the notion of locality and relativity is uh, at least as old as Galileo. Um, yeah. We had Galilean invariance, and even in uh, general relativity, we have this notion. Um, so um, we also have the, 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 some egocentric uh, ideas in um, neuroscience. Uh, so it's a recurrent theme in many disciples, uh, disciples of science. Um, but what was the, the book or podcast? Like, what were you recommending? It's, huh? it's Jeff, uh, yeah, Jeff Hawkins, who's the uh, new mentor, founder. Um, he's, uh, it's the book's called, the, uh, yeah, sure. It's, it, the book's called A Thousand Brains. Uh, the mm-hmm. A Thousand, thousand Brains. Brains yeah. Theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I like, I'm not, I'm not a neuroscientist at all. And I read it basically as it's a sort of fun popular science introduction to, to, to his perspective on, on, on intelligence, but it's, it's, it's very much kind of treats locality, sort of local coordinate reference frames as, as being sort of the, the central object that he's very, very interested yeah. in. Um, I'll, I'll send a link. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, if you kind okay. of, if you, especially if you approach it from this perspective, you know, if you kind of, if you're coming from a, where you kind of think in these terms anyway, it's kind of fun to kind of, see it in another field mm. um, do you predict one step or multiple steps ahead in the future only one step right uh in, during trade for training um yeah we task the model with predicting just uh one step one step but all uh, at the it, same time no 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 not at the same time uh, it's just that um we make a prediction and then instead of using that prediction to make the next one, we use the ground truth. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So if you're saying you're doing teacher forcing, then you're you're not doing the prediction at the same time. Like you're not parallelizing the train. No, no, we're not parallelizing. Okay. Uh, and during inference, we uh, predict multiple steps in the future uh, or in another regressive fashion. Uh, so you can see in the uh, x-axis in all these figures. Uh, the number of uh, time steps in the future. Yeah. Uh, so in motion capture we have 48, uh, in other we have 20 or so. Yeah, but I mean, like during, you, you also only predict one step ahead, right? But you you take the previous step that you had. Uh, uh, we don't simultaneously predict uh, all the, the, the 20 time steps. If that's what you <laughs> yes. We make one so, prediction and we feed it as an input yeah. to the next, uh, yeah, yeah. But that, like, that's what I would expect if you say you predict multiple time steps ahead. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, okay, cool. But I don't know if there are any other questions. Otherwise, interrupt me while I'm saying my final things. Like, to me, this was an especially interesting paper. Like, I, I really liked it. And there's one more question on this thing now. Ah, I was wondering if you can add positional encoding and train with a transformer framework. Um, like I don't know if you mean uh, whether you can add the positional encoding uh, within the local coordinate frames, uh, but assuming that this is the question, um, then yes, uh, and it would be interesting to see whether um, yeah, the positional encoding. Uh, of the neighbors in the local current frames makes a difference. Uh, I, I haven't performed such an experiment, uh, but it would be very interesting to see, yeah. I, I'm curious. I have thought about it a few times, but I haven't um, made the experiment. Okay. Uh, also, thanks from my side. And yeah, thanks for ask, answering all of the... Oh, th- thanks for answering answering all of the questions.